Welcome to our webinar, View Extraordinary Nursing Through the See Me as a Person Framework, a tool for getting great DAISY nominations. My name is Liz Kuhn, and I will be your moderator today. You should have received a handout for this webinar from me yesterday. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know a couple things. Your phone will be automatically muted, and if you have questions throughout the presentation, Please, please use the chat section of the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll take a pause in the middle of the presentation, and then again at the end of the presentation for questions. Today's presenters are Bonnie Barnes with the DAISY Foundation, Mary Kalarudis with Creative Healthcare Management, and Nancy Dole with Covenant Healthcare. With that, I want to thank you again for joining us today, and I will pass it over to Bonnie. Thank you so much, Liz. You are a, a great facilitator for these webinars, and I'm so grateful to have you making things so smooth for all of our guests. And it's wonderful to have all of you with us today. I wish we were in a room together so we could see each other and, and share this time together more personally, but how wonderful the technology can at least let us review this presentation in the comfort of our, our own conference rooms and offices. Many of you are from DAISY organizations from all over the United States, and many of you don't have the DAISY Award for Extraordinary Nurses program, and we hope that uh, this will encourage you to consider celebrating your nurses with this very meaningful recognition program. Of course, I want to say a huge thank you to our DAISY Foundation sponsor, Creative Healthcare Management, for all your support and your friendship, and of course, for making this webinar happen. Two years ago, Mark and I, my husband Mark, whom you see in this picture, who just walked in the room, Mark and I had the privilege of meeting Mary, one of the authors of a marvelous book called See Me as a Person. Mary was familiar with Daisy, and she gave me a copy of her book, and I have to tell you that as I read it, a light bulb went off in my head. The See Me as a Person framework describes interactions between patients and families and their nurses, and explains the magic that happens when a nurse and patient truly connect. And what results is a relationship so beautiful that that patient or family member feels compelled to express their gratitude to their nurse through a DAISY nomination. Well, as you'll hear today, what I perceived at first as magic, it's not magic. This kind of interaction is thoughtful, it's mindful, it's a conscious approach to building a compassionate connection with patients. And that's something so many of you do so naturally, and you don't even know it. Well, we hope that when you as nurses see this happening and being uh, provided to patients and families by other nurses, you will understand that they're not just doing their job, and it is indeed something very special, because the impact this interaction has on patients is profound. And we hope that you'll see in yourselves and in each other the real impact you're having on patients and families. So our objectives today are, next slide please, to learn about the components of the See Me as a Person framework that Mary and her co-author so beautifully present, and secondly, then, how to apply these components uh, of this framework to your patient interactions and therefore generate great DAISY nominations by nurses. Next slide, please. Well, just a, a moment to introduce, for those of you who are not terribly familiar with DAISY, why we at this foundation are so passionate about the work that nurses do every day. Uh, may I introduce you to my stepson, Patrick, and his wife, Tina, and their brand new baby, uh, Riley. This picture was taken just six weeks, uh, six weeks after Riley was born when Patrick developed uh, some symptoms of the autoimmune disease, ITP. He went into the hospital with this diagnosis, and Mark and I got to spend the next eight weeks of his life, the final eight weeks of his life, with him. Our experience during his hospitalization was mind-blowing, frankly. We got to see for the first time what nurses really do, and we were so touched by the care he had from his nurses that we just had to say thank you for what nurses do every day. We were compelled to say it in a meaningful way that nurses would really understand the gratitude that patients and families feel for them. So we created the DAISY Award for Extraordinary Nurses and uh, hoped that we could help nurses understand the real difference that you all make. 
Well, the DAISY Award today has gone way beyond anything Mark and I ever imagined when we started the program. As of today, this is an ongoing recognition program in 1,668 healthcare facilities in all 50 states and nine other countries. We work across the continuum of care in all kinds of settings. We know that more than 40,000 nurses have been honored so far. But even more important to us is the fact that more than 400,000 nurses have been nominated by their patients, families, and colleagues. More than 400,000 times, someone has taken the time to tell their story of compassion and impact that a nurse has had on them because their nurses were attuned to that patient's situation and they acted on their sensitivity. The DAISY Award has had benefits that we never imagined. What happens when nurses are recognized goes across the spectrum of everyone involved. There are personal benefits for nurses across the board. Those who are nominated realize that someone took the time to tell their story. That's a pretty powerful impact. Those who are honored, of course, are uh, because they've been nominated by patients and families and have been chosen by their peers. Well, it's a, a wonderful experience and a source of great pride for those honorees. All who attend the presentation are uplifted by this celebration, and this happens from the C-suite to the bedside. And the nurses who run the DAISY Award program have a tremendous opportunity for their leadership development. They are inspired by the nominations they read, and mostly they tell us they have such a good time doing this. A couple of years ago, we wanted to understand what were the benefits that organizations were perceiving from having the DAISY Award program in their, in their facilities. So we conducted some research in 20 of our sites. And just to give you a real top line of uh, what we found, and this material has been published now in Nursing Economics and two or three other places, so it's very easy to find the full, full study. But first of all, the DAISY Award is a great way to celebrate all the right that is going on in healthcare. And as I mentioned before, the impact goes from the bedside to the, the C-suite. You are all so attuned to what's going on that's wrong. What's wrong with a patient, what's wrong with a process, what's wrong with a system, what's wrong with the parking. But what happens when you put the same amount of emphasis on, that you put on what's going wrong on what's going on that's right? And boy, there is a lot of right going on in healthcare. Very positive cultures are reinforced. Cultures of teamwork, of recognition of the true ministry of nursing, and of course, pride. The pride in being a nurse and the pride in having chosen this career. And one of my favorite quotes that came out of our study was one of a nurse who was honored with the DAISY Award said, my career has been authenticated. So once again, our goals for today, we are eager to help you generate lots and lots of detailed stories of nurses' impact in your DAISY nominations. We hope that the See Me as a Person framework will provide a way for you to view your nurse-patient interactions in a way you may not have thought about it before. And you'll understand why these interactions are so, so powerful from the patient and family's point of view. And the bottom line is, if someday we can go through a day of our DAISY career not hearing the words, oh, I didn't do anything special, I was just doing my job, you will truly recognize that you're ordinary. What you perceive to be ordinary is from your patients and their family's point of view extraordinary. Well, now it's my privilege to introduce Mary Kalaroudis to you, uh, Vice President of Creative Healthcare Management and one of the most inspirational people I have ever met. Mary? Well, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, same to you. <laughs> I appreciate the, the opening comments and uh, really getting clear of what a shared vision we have. Throughout my career, I have been uh, seeking ways to bring into the light the incredible work that nurses do that is often behind the door or behind the screen in those intimate moments with patients. And so I'm so very grateful for the DAISY Award and uh, the, the eliciting of these stories and really appreciate uh, being able to partner with you and perhaps create even more form and focus so that uh, not only are nurses saying I'm not just doing my job, that they're really clear about the knowledge that's inherent in the work that they're doing. I wish that I had uh, my co-author's picture up here with me as well as you did with your husband, Bonnie, because my co-author is a psychologist 
and uh, also my husband, Michael Trout, and he has been critical to making sure that not only is this work uh, offered for nursing care, but for all disciplines, because his lens comes from a different discipline, and uh, I think this is an interprofessional framework that I'd love us to be talking about, not only within the realm of nursing, but in all disciplines. So let's begin with this next quote. Uh, I love this by Andre Nouwen. He says, anyone who enters into the pain of a stranger is a truly remarkable person. And I think this is one of two truths I want to begin my thoughts with you about. It captures what I believe about nursing and the sacred nature of our work. When we become a nurse, we choose to enter a profession that brings us directly into the lives of strangers in a most intimate way. Along with our license to care comes the privilege of being present with people during life-altering times. This is truly remarkable. To be present with another human being and render care requires great knowledge and skill. It is often uh, associated with our technical knowledge that is very, very important in the most visible part of our work. We administer medications. We help save lives. We prepare people for procedures and pre provide treatments to heal physical wounds. And we ease physical pain through a variety of comfort measures. These are very visible actions. Yet to be with a person during times of illness, to really understand the patterns of the human response to illness and crisis, to help people cope with their circumstances, also to requires great knowledge and skill, and I believe great courage. It's not easy to be present in the face of suffering and pain. And yet it is through the human connection that we help people heal wounds that are not necessarily visible. And it is through the human connection that the purpose and meaning of nursing is manifested. The second truth is about what we all need as human beings when we are ill, vulnerable, needing to put our lives or the lives of our loved ones in the hands of others. And this truth is both simple and complex. At the simplest level, we need connection. And the principle that guides me here that connection heals and isolation destroys spirit, so connection is critical. And it is brought forth when we feel seen, when we feel listened to, and when those providing care give us their undivided attention. A patient said this beautifully as she described what it felt like to be in a hospital needing care. She said, the nurse is my whole world. It makes me feel better when you see me as your main attraction. Now this speaks to the heart of the therapeutic nurse-patient relationship better than any words I could bring forth. This relationship, in the next slide, facilitates three key capacities. It's, it's a very intentional relationship. One of the capacities in patients is to help them cope with their circumstances to gain some understanding of what, what this illness experience, this crisis means in their lives, and to the degree possible, take ownership for their own healing. This relationship is intentional and it is focused on the other, and it's, very, it's the only relationship that expects nothing in return because it is devoted to the care and the well-being of the other. Because this vital relationship, next slide please, is, is invisible to some degree, which we've already said, it can be seen as something random or even mysterious, thinking that people either have this ability to connect or they don't, that somehow it is not teachable, that it cannot be learned. And we are saying that is not true. Michael Trout and I went about demystifying what a caring and therapeutic interaction looks like when we are at our best so that we could take what has been invisible into the realm of visibility, tangibility. Our learning came through listening to hundreds of stories from nurses 
and those people that Michael interacts with in his field. It also came from reflecting on our own practice, and probably as important as any of the other as parents of a child with a chronic illness. It came from being on the other side of the door with her and seeing what works and what doesn't. Stories are so very important because they color in the lines of this mysterious element of our practice. Brene Brown says stories are data with soul, and I love that, because they are as vital uh, evidence as those things that are often more tangible and quantifiable. Let me review the four practices just very briefly with you. The first one is presence through attunement. And we've talked about attuning to others. It's, a, it's a literally a, like dialing in on a radio station and seeing the world through the eyes of another. Uh, presence through attunement happens when we attune to ourselves. We notice the white noise in our own heads or the task list that is getting in our way of being able to focus on the person in front of us right now. So we perhaps pause at the door, take a breath, and remember that what this interaction is critically important to the other, and what is routine for us could be life-altering to another. The second practice we called wondering, and we use this face of a child deliberately, because when we're in a state of wonder, we are open and curious about what we are going to discover. We have managed to, uh, to suspend our assumptions and our judgments very consciously and take delight in discovering the human being in front of us right now. It's not an extra thing to do. It's soft, gentle, persistent, and ongoing. It is a, a, a mindset as well as a behavior. We are able to wonder most effectively when we remember that everyone has a backstory, and that backstory is likely informing some of the responses and behaviors that we're seeing right now. And the next practice is called following. We follow by suspending our own agenda, and that's not easy. That's another mindset conscious decision that we make. And focus on what is important to the person, recognizing that the person in our care is our main attraction. So we listen with respect. We want to understand the thinking of the other. And we allow ourselves to connect with their reality. This is a very uh, nuanced and tricky practice. It's certainly about conscious listening. And it's also about resisting our desire for quick fixes and uh, kind of wrapping things up and moving on. And the last practice is called holding. When we take time to attune, wonder, and follow another, we are in effect holding them in our care. When we decide to sit at the bedside and devote two to four minutes with them or five minutes with them to really listen, we are holding them in our care. When we um, when we take a moment to convey what was important to this person to the next person caring for them, all the while making sure we convey it in a message that is respectful and is dignifying to the person, we are holding them in our care. When we advocate for them, we are holding them in our care. Holding means to create a safe haven within which the person is put in the best condition for healing. So those are the practices. They are, uh, again, both, both simple and complex. They are things that we, are, we do when we're at our best. And by naming them, what we hope is that we can begin to access them, even in those moments when we're pressured and feeling the constraints of time and the dynamics of our very complex healthcare system. 
So with that, I'd like to pause and ask if there are any questions or comments at this juncture. And I'm not seeing any questions right now, so Mary, I will turn it back to you to introduce Nancy. Wonderful. It's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Dole. Nancy is a nurse and one of four facilitators of the See Me as a Person workshop at Covenant Healthcare in Saginaw. Nancy's going to share their experience with the workshop and how they've used the practices to shine the light on this element of our care uh, in a very consistent way. So with that, I'd love to introduce Nancy Dole. Thank you, Mary. Um, first of all, I have to give credit. There are five of us that are doing facilitation right now, and we have three more coming um, to be able to do this. So I just want to give them credit as well. But um, I'm so grateful that you asked me to participate today because it gives me the opportunity to share a bit about what we at Covenant Healthcare have gained from the importance of this See Me as a Person program. Um, our next step is to partner with DAISY Foundation to celebrate these amazing interactions that our nurses are having. Uh, joining, we'll go next. Joining forces with creative healthcare management and see me as a person just seemed to fit so naturally with the mission and the vision and the values of Covenant. For example, just to name a few of them, we strive to understand and appreciate our diversity. Our very existence is to serve. We display a high regard for the personal dignity, diversity, and uniqueness of those served. We treat others as we would want to be treated. We seek to find good in all people and all situations. We began working with See Me as a Person shortly after its inception in 2012 after really searching for a strategy to, prevent, or to present comprehensive diversity training. This just seemed the ultimate diversity training, really taking patients beyond categorical thinking to really focusing on the uniqueness of the individual. At the same time, we'd begun a journey to becoming a high reliability organization. And we were struck by how the tenets of See Me as a Person meshed perfectly with those of HRO. The message is really quite the same. Pay attention or attune, question or wonder, listen or follow, and respect differences or hold. So in reality, See Me as a Person has helped us capture many of the things we've been working toward in our organization reigniting that spirit of caring, diversity training, and also just breaking down silos in the organization. Uh, to date, we've completed nine workshops involving nearly 270 of our bedside clinicians, mostly registered nurses, but we've had a few licensed practical nurse, nurses, uh, nursing assistants, members of our pastoral care program, occupational therapists, physical therapists, We've had educators, managers, clinical nurse specialists, and even directors along with the bedside clinicians. I want to say the participants love coming to the workshop, and the evaluations we receive are truly remarkable. They are walking away with a reborn love for nursing and a challenge to remember why they entered this practice to begin with, caring for people. A new understanding of the concept of attunement has opened the eyes of our participants and changed the way they interact with patients. Staff recognize that when attuned, they see their patient as a unique person and not an object in their workload. During times of reflection, participants return to discuss the concepts that we've learned in the workshops and to share stories, like Mary mentioned, of how they have applied these concepts during the workday. One key theme I hear is how important it is to make the time, even if it's just for five minutes, to really fully attune to their patient. Recently, I had a pediatric nurse tell me how she sensed the apprehension of a little girl and her mother on their first visit to deal with the daughter's newly diagnosed diabetes. When they came in for the admission process, before even beginning, the nurse pulled up a chair and sat with them and said, tell me what's in the front of your mind right now. They both began to openly cry, and the mom conveyed that she had just told her daughter that there wouldn't be any more pokes. She hadn't realized what was involved with this diagnosis. Together they sat and discussed what a difficult transition this is, not only for the child, but for the entire family. The nurse, who now demonstrated that she was clearly in it with them, 
explained that this was all necessary, and though she couldn't take that part of the process away, the family felt heard, and they wrote her a stargram of thanks for taking the time to allow them that opportunity. The discussion this nurse had with this family probably lasted no more than a few minutes, but these seemingly tiny moments have a huge impact on those in our care. Learning about wondering has increased our awareness, and we on to the next slide, please, that having a genuine interest in people is where we all really need to start. Clinicians recognize that in order to provide great care, we have to be interested in what the patient can teach us, not just about their illness or physical condition, but about who they are and what they're experiencing. When we gather to reflect, we hear many wonderful stories of how a backstory was learned and how that backstory explains something important about the patient's response to their current situation. Because we have studied wondering as an organization, remembering to wonder is now recognized over and over as a, an especially great tool to help us understand people and is even more helpful when a family member or a patient becomes angry. Staff now see the importance of they themselves when it comes to patient care, how they have a chance to give the gift of their full presence to someone in need. Believe me, this can be very difficult in the fast-paced and chaotic environment in which we all work. But they learn that becoming fully present is a mindful practice and express to us their new understanding the importance of taking a deep breath to refocus upon entering a new patient's room. They now get that each interaction with the patient affects really whether they'll heal or not. They understand the need to be with them, attuned and present and in the moment, to connect to create that true therapeutic relationship. As nurses, we've historically entered a patient's room and wrote down our goals for the day on their whiteboard in their room. Now our facilitators are encouraging the nurses to determine daily goals by asking the patient, What's the most important thing for you today? The patient might say, I want to be able to go to my daughter's wedding. Our nurses follow the patient by including that particular patient's goal on the whiteboard and work with them to blend their goal with those of the overall care team. When physicians and other practitioners enter the room, the patient's goal is visible for everyone to see and to support. We may set a goal for physical therapy which, if attained, may get them out of the hospital and ready for the wedding. This provides a purpose for all and helps the patient feel included as part of their own care team. It shows them that what they tell us is important to them is also important to us. Now, what makes these things acts of following is that we really do something when the, with the information that our patients and their families give us. We may listen attentively, but when we actually demonstrate that we've heard and valued what they said, enough to act on it, people really feel seen. Although we're really in the early stages of this program, we're already seeing a culture change that bringing See Me as a Person has created. Because staff members come from all different areas of the hospital to attend our workshops together, we're building bonds with many diverse departments. Our time together in the workshop allows the opportunity to discuss how all of us have difficulties to overcome. But bottom line, it's about creating the best experience for each of our unique individual patients. This is truly what everyone's main focus is. When we reflect, whether through group emails, huddles, or scheduled reflection sessions, it allows us the opportunity to share those stories, the ones of success, and using concepts that we've learned in the workshop, or maybe even just to seek advice from others when the concepts seem a bit unclear. Other departments have heard of what we're doing and they want to be a part of it. We have reached out to others who interact with patients, such as our pastoral care internship program and our health unit coordinators. We really are creating a movement at Covenant and we're inviting everyone to join in with us. And it's based on the principles of the See Me as a Person program. A brief presentation to our volunteer group brought them on board. We recognize the importance of every interaction with every individual in the institution makes an impact on that patient experience. They, in turn, have spread the word in the community about the great care clinicians that Covenant provide 
and how our focus is to see each patient as a unique person. Right now we're in the process of collecting data with pre and post assessments being sent to our participants using Mary Kolarudis's The Caring Assessment for Caregivers. This is a self-evaluation tool based on Kristen Swanson's five caring processes. Because we're in the early stages of bringing CME as a person to our caregivers, we want to be able to record the effects that these workshops are uh, having on our ability to care for others. And lastly, I personally just want to add that the CME as a Person program is one of the greatest and most well-received programs I've seen implemented in my nursing career, which is now 30 years. It resonates so well with everyone who interacts with our patients and their families. It's given us a new insight into the perspective of the individual who's affected, certainly making you appreciate that the patient is a unique person. It's something we can all relate to, and it's a wonderful reminder of the importance of the work that we as nurses do, recognizing the actual healing power of truly caring for someone. Thank you. Nancy, thank you for that. I, I have, this is Bonnie speaking, and having heard the impact that you're having on your patients through this wonderful framework, I just can't wait to see the DAISY nominations that could come through from Covenant. I know they're going to be some of the very best we've ever seen. Now to really help bring this, these, uh, this framework to life, Mary and I would like to tell a story, a specific story of a DAISY nurse uh, whose name is Ruth and her patient Patty and uh, her, her family as well, uh, the patient's family as well. And what, what we're going to do is to have me tell the story in pieces and I will pause and ask Mary to explain what it is about this part of the story that is applied through the framework so that we can learn what is the extraordinary in what, uh, if you didn't have this framework, you might perceive as being the ordinary. So I will begin with the story of Patty, the patient Patty and her nurse Ruth. Patty was a 41-year-old female who was an attorney. Her nurse Ruth tells the story that she met Patty when she was fresh out of an exploratory surgery a year after her diagnosis for stomach cancer and a year after she'd had a total gastrectomy. Two years previously, Patty and her husband had adopted four-year-old twin girls, and they were just unwilling to discuss any end-of-life issues. They kept insisting that there would be some kind of miracle, and they were putting all of their energy into scouring the Internet for clinical trials looking for just anyone who was doing studies or research on Patty's tumor type or disease state. Mary? Uh, I thought this was a good place to pause because Ruth's description of who Patty is, what their family circumstances were, and her unwillingness to discuss any end-of-life issues really created a baseline for attuning to her and meeting the uh, Patty and her family exactly where they are. Inherent in this attunement is a respect for their perspective and um, I'm inferring from the way Ruth is describing this that she was careful to suspend her own opinions and judgments at this point. Go ahead, uh, let's go to the next part, Bonnie. Sure. Well, when Ruth, the nurse, and her colleagues tried to approach Patty and her husband on the topic of palliative care. Patty absolutely refused to engage in those discussions. And in fact, when her surgeon brought it up, well, Patty threw the surgeon out of her room after his umpteenth attempt to approach her with a, a counter perspective on what he, he apparently disdainfully referred to as her reality. As her oncology clinical nurse specialist, Ruth connected with Patty by focusing her thoughts on her role, on, on Patty's role as a parent, as a wife, as a daughter, and the fact that she really needed to support her husband and parents in the care of their children. So again, this really demonstrates uh, a, a willingness to attune and look at the situation through the perspective of the other, respecting Patty's right and need to move through the process in her own way and rate. 
uh, by wondering and following, Ruth learned about them and really got clear about what it was, what, how they were moving through the process. If she had tried to fix or advise them, she would have shut off any connection or willingness on their part to really be open to what mattered to them. By wondering and following, Ruth was able to let them take the lead and move through in a way that worked for them. Now this sounds obvious when we reflect on it, but you know that caregivers' agendas can be very strong. And when you have a team of people who are seeing uh, Patty's perspective as out of sync with reality, it took great clarity and focus for Ruth to stay with Patty where she was. And Ruth actually did just what Nancy said earlier. She asked Patty what was most important to Patty. Yes. And one day, Patty shared with her that they had planned, she and her husband had planned to take their girls to Disneyland for their upcoming fifth birthday. And Patty asked Ruth if Ruth could help make this happen. Well, that evening, when Patty's husband came to the hospital, the three of them met. And with some degree of compromise, according to Ruth, they figured out a way to get this family to Disneyland. Patty desperately wanted a picture of herself with the kids and with Mickey Mouse so they could have a happy memory of their mom. And Patty wanted to be present the first time her children experienced playing in the ocean. Because she had a cherished picture of herself as a child playing in the ocean for the first time at the same age that her children were, and she wanted her kids to have that same memory. Well, Patty and Ruth and Patty's husband figured out what it would take, and Patty moved forward with a plan that included arranging for the husband to hook Patty up to a bag of fluid every night through her implanted catheter so she wouldn't get too dehydrated with all this activity. Well, many of the professionals in Patty's care, her surgeon, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, thought that Patty and Ruth were crazy for putting this plan together. And why would Ruth encourage and even facilitate what they perceived to be this foolish idea of Patty's? Well, with a lot of reluctance, Ruth got one of them to write out the necessary prescriptions to make this all happen and to provide them a contact in the Disneyland area just in case there was an emergency. Mary? Mm, well, there's a lot going on here. Uh, clearly, this is way beyond facilitating a trip to Disney. Uh, Ruth's devotion to Patty's um, perspective and well-being and by holding her in her care is truly an example, I believe, of the remarkable nature of nursing work. She attuned and followed Patty's ability to share what was critically important to her. So it was a real um, important interaction. She knew Patty did know she was dying. And with the nurse's guidance, she became clear about how important it was for her, Patty, to parent her children through this process. By advocating and by problem solving and by creating safety nets, uh, Ruth continued to hold Patty through the process. And she not only supported Patty's mothering, but created the possibility of memories for her daughters and husband that would be a source of comfort to the family after Patty was gone. So she was really uh, contributing to Patty's uh, ability to continue mothering even after her death. So Mark and I are sitting here with big tears in our eyes as we hear you, Mary, and think about this incredibly important experience that the family had at Disneyland. And several days after their return from Anaheim, Patty was in the hospital again, sadly. And slowly, Ruth was finally able to discuss with her and her husband the importance of creating other memories, those related to what she would eventually leave behind for her children. After her trip, Patty was finally ready to consider this. And while she still remained hopeful, the trip turned out to be a real turning point. It gave her the peace she needed to move towards what became the inevitable. She was able to write letters to each of the children that they could open on significant events. And once that was done, Patty and Ruth were able to discuss the end-of-life issues that absolutely needed to be talked about, such as where Patty wanted to die, 
whether she wanted hospice in their home, and whether she wanted the children there. Plus, Ruth was able to talk about uh, with Patty about what Patty was going to tell the children and, and how she was going to explain that she was just approaching death. So this, this story absolutely exemplifies what it means to be in partnership with a patient. That Ruth's following Patty's lead allowed Ruth to provide leadership. Isn't that an interesting paradox? The therapeutic relationship is one in which the caregiver helps the person cope, find meaning and understanding, and take ownership. And you can see that played out beautifully in this story. In order for Patty to get to the point of discussing end-of-life realities, she needed to take care of what mattered most, her ability to parent her children, to create memories for her children and her husband, memories that would be there long after Patty had left this earth. Because Ruth made Patty's process and made Patty the main attraction by attuning being wondering and being genuinely interested by following, Ruth was able to serve as a healing guide and help Patty and her family navigate this crucially important time with dignity and intention. The other invisible but critically important factor here was Ruth's ability to self-attune and suspend her own agenda and ideas about how this should go and be a true partner with Patty for it to go the way it needed to. I just think this is an incredible example of the extraordinary in the ordinary work we do as nurses. Thank you, Mary. I know all of you who are participating in this webinar have your own stories, either stories that, that you have uh, experienced because of the way you provide care or stories that you've seen in your colleagues. And if, uh, if in a few moments you'd like to share any of that with us and we can talk about how the See Me as a Person framework has applied to your extraordinary work, we would love to hear them. But one more story we would love to share with you is a story that Nancy is going to tell. And again, you will see how the extraordinary lives in the ordinary. And this is a tale of the impact that you as nurses make in a moment. Nancy? Hi, thanks. Yes, um, you know, I talked about reflection, and part of our workshops are bringing people back to reflect on how they've implemented their practices or to share stories, and I tend to be the keeper of the stories, and I received this email, which I thought was great. It just reminds you of how caring can happen in just a moment, and these are situations that happen to us every day as nurses on the floor in the hospital, so I'll, I'd love to share this, um, and let me read it. I'd like to share difficult patients that none of the nurses could seem to connect to and quite frankly didn't want to have to care for. This patient was becoming increasingly non-compliant with taking prescribed medications. I would go in the room and ask if he needed anything at all and was trying to be extremely attuned to his needs. He would grumble that he didn't need anything and, and to leave him alone. Whenever I entered the room to check on him, he was angry and would t just yell and tell me to leave him alone. The patient seemed visibly in pain and was refusing to take any of the available pain medications that I offered. Finally, I sat down and asked the patient what he did to help with pain. After some discussion, I came to find that he took one specific pain medication at home for nerve pain and one muscle relaxer. Neither were prescribed for the patient in the hospital. The patient stated that he's been on these medications since the late 1980s and he needed them. I notified the doctor of this finding and was able to get the medications reordered for the patient. After finding out how long he'd taken these and that this was why he was so upset, he was much more open to our staff and we were able to effectively manage his pain. Instead of just assuming this patient was unable to be happy with anything we could do for him and labeling him as non-compliant, Using wondering to find out his history and exactly what he needed made the patient and the staff happy. I thought that was a great example of um, really changing somebody. Absolutely. This is Mary. I just love that story because it is, it's, uh, it's, it so shows how we can get hung up if we 
stay with a label rather than wondering. I think the concept of non-compliant becomes obsolete when we uh, make a decision to wonder and instead see the patient's behavior as, uh, instead of seeing it as resistant, it becomes a reason to be interested when we make a decision to wonder. We see behavior as symptom. And the nurse certainly did that. She followed the cues. I, I noticed she said he seemed visibly to be in pain. She sat down, which tells him in uh, ways words may not, that I'm here to really listen to you. She clearly understood his anger as a, a response and a symptom rather than something she needed to take personally. So she tuned, wondered, followed, and held, and in doing that, uh, she found quick resolution. So the resolution was not only in the alleviation of his physical pain, but it also reconnected him and the rest of the team and, and alleviated the pain that comes from feeling separate and isolated that both the nursing staff was feeling and caring for him. And you know he had to be experiencing that as well. So love that. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Mary. Now we would love to invite any of our guests to share their stories. If, if uh, anyone would like to tell a brief story about a patient interaction that we can describe in terms of the see me as a person framework, we'd love to do that. And all you need to do is, is type in the chat that you're interested in. Liz will be happy to unmute you. Liz, do we have any storytellers? There are not any showing up yet. <laughs> Any questions from anyone, if I may solicit Actually, them? Actually, there was some questions earlier about um, if there was a book available on the See Me as a Person framework or what's involved in the workshops that um, Nancy was talking about. So Mary, do you want to just briefly describe that or would you rather follow up with people after the webinar? Um, yeah, I, there is a book and there there's information on the workshop and if they just let, let me know, I'd be happy to send them some information. Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. All right, we have three people so far that are volunteering stories. I am going to start. Nice. Um, all right, give me a second here. Great. It looks like Sherry, but you are under the name of Rachel again. So I've unmuted you, Sherry. Do you want to speak and see if we can hear you? Sherry, are, are you unmuted on your end? All right. I'm going to try Rita Ferguson. Rita, I'm going to unmute you. You want to try talking? That's a powerful mute button. <laughs> I know it. Um, Just well, Liz, to yeah, I, I would like to suggest perhaps in the interest of time that while we would love to hear these stories that perhaps uh, whoever it is that's, that you, you'll be able to tell us who it is that would like to share them and maybe Mary and I could do a one-on-one -on -one with be happy um, to. individuals. Wouldn't that be fun, Mary? Yeah, it would be delightful, yes. Okay. May we that go sounds to good. Why don't we do There are several, um, several people that are wanting to share stories, which is great. That's terrific. We can do a, a follow-up on this. It would be great. Maybe we can put all the storytellers together on, on one uh, connection. Yes. Please be sure and send us your names and let us know, and we'll make that happen. That would be great. Okay. May we go to the last slide, please? I'm just reading through. There's been actually lots of comments. Do you want to hear some of the comments? Sure. sure. Okay. It says, let me find. Only the good ones, though, Liz. <laughs> Only the good ones, right? Uh, there's one that says, um, I am part of a team that focuses on identifying patients who are high risk for readmission. Our experience has been that many patients return because we missed the boat. We don't see them where they are. So that's kind of a learning from today that came across. We have another comment that says, I'm a faculty member, and I have been using the See Me as a Person stories from the book as she begins class. 
This has been a way to discuss how we care for patients in the midst of our busyness and how we attune to them. It's been a very good strategy to have the students think about how they can care for their patients. I guess it's Wonderful. Her, she's saying it's her way of caring for her students. That's mm. great. Lovely. There are actually uh, several questions coming through about a recording of this. So we have been recording this webinar, and everybody that signed up will get an email next week with a link to the recording, and you're welcome to use it however you'd like. You know, I would just add that um, that we will be having a book study group as well. And for those who are interested in the storytelling, that they may want to be sure and look for that. We'll be sending out some information. That'll start in May. Oh, that's great. There's a comment that um, their best practice at their hospital is that they sit, or with their healthcare organization, is that they sit with their patients and identify their goals and barriers to staying out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Yeah, there's a lot of comments coming through, so I'll make sure that Nancy and Mary and Bonnie see all of the comments, and those of you that said you were willing to share a story, Bonnie and Mary will follow up with you to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation about that. I think that'll be great. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, there's information, Mary, you mentioned the book. People are asking for information on that. I'll make sure in the email that goes out with the recording that there's information on uh, the book and how to access the book club. Yes. Yes. All right. Bonnie, do you want me to, or Mary, I'll turn it back over to you for the final slide in closing. All right. Thank you. Well, I... I want to express my appreciation to all of you that have taken the time to be on this webinar with us. It's really a privilege. Uh, we've made clear, I think, that the this sacred work of nursing is often silent and that part of our, our work together is to bring it into the light so that the value and the significance is um, seen, understood, and transformed related to our young. So thank you very much. And of course we at the DAISY Foundation are so proud and, and honored to be able to help you make this sacred work not silent by celebrating and sharing these extraordinary stories of, of care that you provide to your patients and their families every day. And at the at underneath it all, what we have learned through the last 14 years of the DAISY Award is that nursing it's not just about the work you do, it's about who you are and who you are in your very conscious, present, mindful time with your patients is, is indeed a, a sacred work. So I, I share the gratitude that Mary has expressed to all of you. We say thank you for being nurses and of course thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to your feedback and your comments and to continuing this wonderful relationship that we have with all of you and, and hopefully more of you who will come to the DAISY Award. Thank you. Hey, Bonnie, this is Liz. I, I did one more comment came across that I think would actually be a good summary from either you or Mary. Is there wanting just a summary statement or clarification about how the CME as a person framework will actually help them get more DAISY nominations? That, that um, is a little unclear quite yet, so I think that would be a good summary, a good summary statement to end on if you or Mary wanted to take that. I sure appreciate that and because of course that was one of our specific goals of this webinar, we hope that in applying the framework and in seeing the framework that nurses will be able to see in each other that what you've always said, well that's just doing our job, is really a, a very thoughtful approach to patient care. It's much deeper than, than what might be perceived at the start and that nurses will, uh, will honor other nurses by seeing in their work how extraordinary they really are and therefore writing DAISY nominations. And we, we also uh, have, a frame, uh, have put the framework together with some questions that could help you think through and, sh and shape your stories using the, the practices. So those, those will be available to you if you're interested in those as well. I hope that answers the question. Of course, you know, one thing we've seen over the years is that when nurses are themselves patients, they absolutely get it. What we're suggesting is that when 
when you are seeing in each other the see me as a person perspective in your practice that you will be inspired to write the nominations for other nurses. Does that answer the question you think, Liz? Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you that have questions that we have not gotten to, I will make sure the right person follows up with you and gets you the information. There's still more questions on um, how the workshop that Nancy talked about can come to their organization and what kind of the structure of that is. So I'll make sure we do individual follow-up on those questions if yours didn't get answered. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Liz, for doing a great job facilitating. Yes, yay. Anytime. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.